It's uh, five past 12. I welcome everybody, this uh, huge number of participants in our first webinar in uh, 2022. I will directly give the floor to our <laughs> director, who is very busy today, so he will need to join another important meeting and I don't waste more minutes. Alexis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marika. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, uh, first, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to, to welcome all of you. Um, it's, uh, the, the topic of today is it's, uh, extremely important for, for the MCDDA and for me as director, uh, both for women and drugs, uh, but also for gender equality. So um, it's also about uh, the MCDD and its staff and all people working with us. Um, um, I cannot resist to, to the idea to pay a, tri a tribute, special tribute to all women uh, in Ukraine or fleeing Ukraine today and those weeks. Uh, but I would like to extend to, uh, to women who are in other regions of the world, also in places where there is a war, uh, because uh, what's happening in Ukraine is totally horrible and unacceptable. Uh, but I think that it's equally unacceptable not to speak about the same kind of people, victim of other similar situation in other places of the world. So I think solidarity should be either all, all solidarity or nothing. So that's that's the the message I want to share with you. Um, I think I think the, those webinars uh, and of course specifically uh, the, the the topic for today they they show uh, they illustrate one of the uh, uh, important changes we tried to bring uh, as CMCDDA to the way we work. Uh, both because um, you will certainly notice that uh, uh, most of the time in our webinars is not CMCDDA speaking. Um, and I, I think that's one of the originality of, of our webinars is to give the floor, to give visibility to our partners, uh, to experts from the field, from the civil society, also scientific experts. And I think with uh, Christiana, Sara and Christina today, uh, we have uh, another very good example. And I, I'm very proud they accepted to, to speak and to participate in, in this webinar. I, I have... Uh, a special message to Christina from EAG because um, uh, uh, her participation is a, a very concrete illustration of um, the, the cooperation that we established with other European agencies. Uh, it may look a bit esoterical uh, for, for those who don't know the, the kind of uh, European galaxy, uh, but, uh, but actually there, there, there are all reasons for EMCDDA to cooperate uh, with the European Institute for Gender Equality. Uh, for the same reason, we are cooperating with the Fundamental Rights Agency and we are developing a partnership uh, regarding the work, uh, the work with migrants. Um, and there are other uh, cooperations that are ongoing. Uh, so, so I, I certainly ask Christina to convey my best regards to her director. And then I, I have special thanks uh, to, to the permanent uh, uh, actor and promoter for the webinars. It's uh, Marika and Alessandra. And of course, I, I don't want to forget Marco. I welcome also Judy Chang, who, who joined us. Uh, and then I, I have uh, extremely special, wonderful thanks to Linda, uh, because Linda, uh, Linda is someone who's fully dedicated and Linda never abandoned. So every time, even when at EMCDDA we were less active or were less conscious of the importance to, to keep an eye on what's happening uh, to, with, and for women and drugs, uh, um, Linda always continued to work, provide support, provide input, uh, and she has my full support for that, and uh, I'm extremely thankful for that. So, so um, as, uh, as Marika said, um, and, and I can. I really want you to believe me. I, I really hate uh, the idea that uh, I need to say I'm so busy and so important. I have another very important meeting. Uh, so usually when I'm there, I'm attending the, the entire webinar and I'm also uh, sharing concluding remarks. Well, today it's not possible um, because actually we have uh, uh, just this afternoon 
uh, we have an informal webinar with all the members of our management board. Some of you probably know that uh, there is a proposal uh, of the European Commission to change the mandate of the MCDDA, to broaden this mandate. And this afternoon, I'm expected to answer to the practical questions from the members of our management board, from the representative of the member states, to explain what those proposals of the Commission would mean in terms of action, consequences for the agency, consequences for our customers. And, uh, and I think, uh, for me, the, the best way to prepare myself for that other presentation is to take a bit the the taste of some of your presentation. I, I, I will not say bye-bye. I, I will uh, I already close my webcam. I will listen to some of you, then I will have to leave. But why is it important? Because uh, with the new business model that was adopted by our, our management board in December uh, on, on our proposal, we have the commitment to go to move forward in changing the business model of the MCDDA to make it even more customer-centric. And for me, to be customer-centric means, first of all, to be more useful for practitioners working on the drug field, to be more useful for people who are using drugs and their families, their relatives. And this cannot be done without you. And I think the participation, the, the audience and, and the speakers in this webinar, uh, they are the most concrete illustration of what we try to achieve as European Drugs Agency to be at the service of the community and the citizens. So I wish you a fruitful discussion. And uh, I promise that I will uh, uh, watch the recorded version, not to lose anything of uh, what you have shared together today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexis, for this uh, wonderful and uh, energy boosting <laughs> introduction. I will leave the floor to, to Linda, Linda Montanari, who will be the chair for this uh, session today. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Marika, and thank you, Alexis, for the nice words. I would like to welcome everyone, and we are glad that we are so numerous and uh, such a large audience for this topic. Uh, the webinar of today is Women and Drugs. Uh, we know that women are just a minority among the people who use drugs, but they have uh, specific characteristics, specific needs and pathways to drug use and drug uh, addiction in some cases. Despite this, the uh, drug field has often been uh, considered as a gender neutral uh, phenomenon. Uh, and when gender, a gender dimension was considered, often it focused on women and especially on specific characteristics and the maternal role of women. Uh, while this is, uh, of course, really important because it's actually concerning mainly the women, the care of children and family and so on, still, uh, like in the rest of the society, there are other issues that are also important uh, and like uh, gender-based violence, stigma, but also uh, women's agency in drug taking. Uh, it is important to consider this. Uh, in this webinar, we would like to discuss the role that gender as a social structure has on influencing women's behavior and uh, in particular uh, drug use behavior among women. We will discuss this and we would also like to see how and try to discuss how the changes in the gender role in the society may influence also changes in drug use behaviors. Uh, also, we, we try to uh, conceive this webinar thinking that women are not all the same. So when we look at the drug phenomenon, we should uh, consider the gender dimension, but also the intersecting of this gender dimension with other, uh, other factors, other dimensions, and consider also specific group of women, uh, like uh, sex workers, migrants, women in prison. Uh, so we will try to discuss this uh, and women and drugs across also different generation and see how what has changed. 
and uh, we will discuss with four distinguished experts that are here with us and uh, that will present their perspective. So they will talk from different professional backgrounds, different experience, uh, uh, different countries and institutions. But before uh, giving the floor to the first speaker, I would like to show a motion graphic that we prepared in 2019 uh, in occasion of the Women's Day. Let's see if I manage to show the graph, the motion graphic. 37 million women have used an illicit drug at least once in their lifetime. Around 100,000 women enter drug treatment every year. Nearly 2,000 die from drug overdose. Over the last decade, the gender gap has been narrowing among young school students who use drugs. Women represent only a fifth of clients in specialized drug treatment, but their problems are often more complex than for men. They tend to progress faster towards addiction, a phenomenon known as telescoping. They go through more severe withdrawal symptoms and report higher levels of depression and anxiety. Women often start using drugs through a drug-using male partner and are more likely to share needles and other equipment with their partner. In general, women are likely to have fewer socio-economic resources. This is even more the case for women who use drugs. They experience more stigma because they may be perceived as contravening their roles as mother and caregiver. Some groups of women have specific needs, such as pregnant and parenting women, women from ethnic minorities, women in prison, and those involved in sex work. A specific drug-related issue for women is intimate violence and drug-facilitated sexual assaults, which has serious psychological and social consequences. Services for women with drug use problems need to address these unique concerns. They need to be welcoming, non-judgmental, supportive, and physically and emotionally safe. To achieve this, women who use drugs need to be fully involved in the planning and development of policies and services. The staff recruited in drug services need to have appropriate attitudes, knowledge and skills. Services need to be well coordinated and integrated to address different issues such as mental health, pregnancy and childcare. And monitoring and research needs to consider this gender dimension to optimise effective responses for women with drug-related problems. I hope you enjoyed the motion graphic and you can uh, download the, graph the motion graphic uh, and see in uh, in internet, uh, in our website and YouTube. So now uh, it's time to give the floor to the first uh, speaker. Um, Cristina Fabre Rossell. Cristina works as a gender based violence team leader at the European Institute for Gender Equality. She's project manager of the studies related to administrative data collection on specific forms of gender based violence and advancing the measurement and the conceptual framework of fem femicide. Cristina was head of unit of Observatory Against Domestic and Gender-Based Violence and member of the Equal Rights Commission of the Spanish General Council of the Judiciary. As gender consultant, she contributed to the project on establishing a gender-based violence measurement framework in Central America and on strengthening the victim's right in criminal justice system in Turkey. Uh, Christina, she's also a member of the European Group on Gender and Drugs. So we would like to ask Christina uh, a, gen a question, first question, uh, not referring to the drug field, but in general, how has changed the role of gender in society and how this has influenced women's behavior and main issues? Thank you, Christina. Uh, thank you, Linda. And um, thank you also, Alexis, for, for inviting Eike at this webinar. It's, uh, it's very encouraging to see how sensible uh, your agency is towards uh, gen uh, gender issues and how committed you are to apply to gender perspective in the research and policies. So it's uh, my pleasure to be here. Well, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I will talk a, a bit on the links between the gender-based violence and drugs, but I, um, I will also introduce uh, how we can use gender mainstreaming in our research and our policies. So I will start by the definition of gender 
from the Istanbul Convention. So that the term gender explains based on the biological differences between male and female that are socially constructed the roles, behaviors, uh, activities and attributes that are given the, that a given society considers appropriate for women and men. The concept of gender defines the expectations, entitlements, and values that are proper to women and men in a specific context. For instance, we said this so few days ago how Afghan girls uh, happy to resume their education at the schools were sent back home. High schools for girls will remain closed uh, until new plans for attendance are formulated in accordance with the Islamic law. So research has shown that certain roles or stereotypes reproduce unwanted and harmful practices and may lead our societies to tolerate violence against women. To overcome such um, gender roles, Article uh, 12 of the Istanbul Convention, but also our um, EU gender equality strategy frames the eradication of prejudices, customs, traditions, and other practices which are based on the idea of the inferiority of women or on stereotype gender roles as a general obligation to prevent violence. Elsewhere, the convention calls for a gendered understanding of violence against women and domestic violence as a basis for all measures to protect and support the victims. This means that these forms of violence need to be addressed in the context of prevailing inequality between women and men existing as stereotypes, gender roles and discrimination against women in order to adequately respond to the complexity of the phenomenon. Gender mainstreaming has been adopted internationally to achieve gender equality and to combat discrimination. This approach foresees the inclusion of gender perspective in the preparation, design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of policies, legal measures, and spending programs. Thus making policies more responsive to the needs of all citizens, men, women, girls, boys, when the notion of gender is mainstream in policy making and in legislative provisions, public interventions become more effective and avoid the perpetration of inequalities. Gender is effectively mainstream only when there is a true political commitment and when a proper legislative framework is in place. Gender indicators, gender equality training, gender statistics, gender awareness raising campaigns, and sex disaggregated data are just some of the concrete methods applied to identify gender inequalities and to help improve the quality of policy making and the functioning of our public institutions. According to the UN, gender statistics are statistics that adequately reflect differences and inequalities in the situation of women and men in all areas of life. Statistics needs to be collected and presented disaggregated by sex as a primary and overall classification and reflecting gender issues. Gender statistics must be based on concepts and definitions that reflect the diversity of women and men and capture all aspects of their lives and be collected using methods that take into account stereotypes and social and cultural factors that may induce gender biases in the data. Data must reflect women and men's conditions, roles and their needs and specific problems. Gender analysis of which uh, data collection constitutes the first step is therefore the study of difference in the conditions, needs, proportion, participation rates, access to services and resources between men and women. Gender analysis indeed attempts to unveil the underlying cause of gender discrimination and to tackle the cause of the problem with a view to, under, to responding to the different needs of women and men and to avoiding the policy measures led to, to further inequalities. The notion of gender is intrinsically linked to the intersectionality and factors such economic and migration status, rate, race, ethnicity, disability, and age should be considered in the development of implementation of gender sensitive policies. We live in the world where every third woman has experienced physical and or sexual violence perpetrated by men. This comes from the uh, latest uh, data released by WHO last year 
and uh, it means that we live in a world where women are not safe, neither at home, on the streets, at the workplace, nor on online, on the virtual uh, world. There is a common knowledge that violence against women and substance use are connected. However, the connection is complex and requires a deeper analysis and understanding of the trauma aspect of abusive experience the women face, the dynamics of abusive relationships, and the societal aspects of tolerance of both gender-based violence and substance use. Research show that women who have been abused by intimate partners are more likely to use or become dependent on substances as compared to women who have never been have never experienced intimate partner violence. One recent study showed that women with a recent history of experiencing intimate partner violence had nearly six times the risk of problematic alcohol use. And also women under the effects of drugs may be more vulnerable because of their impaired ability to recognize and avoid predatory silence or because of their higher chance to be exposed to them. To them. Research has uh, documented immediate adverse trauma related physical and mental health effects resulting from intimate partner violence, including chronic pain, injury, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and substance use. For many victims, who use substance, it is a way to cope with the traumatic effects of abuse. Research also found that the highest number of women among users, it's found to, it's found to take tranquilizers, uh, sedative, and other pharmaceutical uh, drugs. Thus, we see that the women are mostly trying to calm themselves down, meaning that uh, to deal with the inner noise caused by trauma while men are more prone to recreational drugs. Only by these study findings, we see how gender perspective is important. These findings suggest that the different reasons women and men may be seeking and using substances. Therefore, different treatment, prevention, and post-intervention measures should be created and implemented. Other intimate partner uh, violence victims are coerced into using by an, in, an abusive partner who then sabotage their efforts towards recovery and threaten to undermine them with disclosing their substance use to the authorities. These tactics are used to further control their partner and have the chilling effect on victims' ability to access, safety, and support, and to retain custody of their children. Emerging research demonstrate that substance use coercion is common within abusive relationships. While substance use coercion remains an emerging area of research in itself, it is an important contextual factor to consider when reviewing research on the relationship between intimate partner violence and substance use. Societal belief about alcohol consumption, gender roles, and violent behavior can also affect the risk of alcohol-related partner violence. For instance, in some societies, both heavy drinking and violent um, behaviors towards female partners are associated with masculinity. Moreover, in some countries, belief that alcohol facilitates aggression have led to drinking so that individuals can carry out violence perceived to be social, um, socially expected. Equally, social belief that a woman drinking is a cause of violence may be in some cultures be seen as a mitigating factor. Thus, understanding the gender aspect of substance abuse and abuse is paramount. Furthermore, Research show that children who witness violence, including threats of violence between their parents, are more likely to develop violent and delinquent behaviors during childhood and heavy drinking partners to work or alcohol dependence later in life. Thus, preventing intimate partner violence would also be a prevention of substance abuse. So gender-based violence and substance use should be analyzed in conjunction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina, for this uh, introduction. Uh, I'll give now the floor to the second uh, speaker. There will be space for discussion after the four 
presentation, but you can already, if you have any question, you can put your question in the question and answer uh, uh, section. So the, uh, the second speaker is Christiana Vallespires. Christiana is integrated researcher and lecturer um, at the Faculty of Education and Psychology of the Catholic University in Porto, Portugal, and she's founding member of Cosmic Air Association. She began researching the intersections of gender and drug use in 2014, and she led the creation of innovative harm reduction and bystander intervention approaches to prevent sexualized violence and other form of gender-based violence in drinking and drug use environments. Currently, she's consultant in the field of gender and drugs with the MCDDA, and she's also a member of the European Group on Gender and Drugs. Christiana, the question for you is how drug use behavior among women change in the life course and how they've changed across generation. And we uh, in particular ask you to focus on young women and in recreational setting. Christiana, the floor is yours. So hello, good morning. Uh, hello, Linda and colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to, to have the, the opportunity to present and build this discussion with you today. And good morning to all the people that are assisting uh, to this conversation. So you can move the, um, to the other one. Uh, so I was invited to think about uh, gender in particular and particularly the experiences of uh, youth and young women who use drugs. Uh, and having you know, this genera generational discussion, like uh, for one hand, the fact that, that youth and young adults are in a kind of transition um, phase of their lives from the, the dependence, financial and material dependence uh, from their parents to autonomy, to the adult, adulthood autonomy, but also experimenting a lot and being exposed uh, to a lot of peer, uh, peer pressure and social pressure uh, towards idealized images of adulthood and also uh, idealized uh, images of gender. Uh, so this is um, this is uh, relevant also to to analyze or to build an understanding of drug use in these uh, young ages, uh, from 16 to 34. That is the period uh, I'm focusing, and I like also to think in terms of generation generations. Uh, and in this case, I would be talking about millennials and also Generation Z. Uh, that it's curious that these generations are more exposed to an increasing gender uh, gender discussions and gender mainstreaming topics. Uh, so probably they they are building their gender identities with uh, you know um, more amplified ref references, considering the globalization and uh, you know communication and information uh, growing and, and and these processes that allowed them to, to build identities in a more complex way. Uh, in addition, no, before that, <laughs> in addition, these two generations, they, you know, they somehow had access uh, to drinking and drug use contexts that traditionally were male dominated and male exclusive. Uh, and this um, is, is uh, relevant uh, because these are places of, for risk and pleasure experimentation. And somehow in the last decades, uh, women uh, were invited uh, by the capitalistic and ne neoliberalist culture to participate and be consumers in these uh, space times. And this is also relevant in terms of uh, gender uh, production or the production or reproduction of uh, crystallized gender relations but also offer interesting stages for gender experimentation and building new uh, femininities and masculinities. And this may be, may be related also with uh, the drug use. So we can say that uh, women began entering these male exclusive and um, intoxication cultures that for several centuries uh, were, you know, uh, merely for uh, the, 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 you know, these hedonistic dimensions were exclusive for men. So now you can change. 
And for this presentation, I used data from Ashpad. And uh, uh, what we can see here is that in general, when we talk about uh, lifetime prevalence of alcohol use, and also in the last, last 30 days, uh, since uh, 2095, uh, uh, sorry, uh, there was a kind of decrease in alcohol use, a slow decrease, and this may be related with changes in, you know, in, in law. Um, but it's also interesting to note that when, when we talk about heavy episodic drinking specifically, or binge drinking, that is the drinking pattern that we can find in nightlife environments. Um, it is dec decreased or uh, a bit in, in boys, but is increasing in, in girls. So what we are seeing you know, when we analyze alcohol is that uh, the gender gap is narrowing um, and probably there are gender negotiations in the access to the intoxication culture and sobriety culture because uh, contemporaneously there are uh, several people talking about sobriety culture because youth groups um, you know, seem to not having the same relationship with alcohol as before. Uh, and this, I think this, um, but on the other hand, more women are engaging in, in this kind of having drink, drinking patterns. So probably um, it would be relevant to have, you know, a gender lens to understand these this, uh, changes in, in drinking patterns. Uh, it's also interesting, and, and I bring, and I brought also cannabis because uh, we can see that in recent uses, uh, also, the, 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 it's growing, uh, the use of cannabis uh, among men and women. And this may also be related with the social acceptability, with an increase in the social acceptability of cannabis promoted by, by all this discussion regarding medical use of cannabis and so on. You can change it now. And when we talk about uh, other drugs or illicit drugs other than cannabis, also data from SPAD, uh, shows us that we can find um, a gender gap, but considering with 1995, we see there, there was an increase and this probably is related with the theory of normalization. And uh, somehow uh, the use of illicit drugs in certain environments or in certain uh, places uh, are seen as more normal uh, than before, let's say. And uh, yeah. And this is a uh, data that I, I like, I would like to highlight, uh, and is connected with something that Christina also said before, that is the relation that women tend to have, and this is a long-term relation, uh, with you know, uh, medicines, let's say, with sedatives and tranquilizers, psychopharmacs. And uh, in this case, uh, also among youth females, uh, we can find, um, you know, and, and is the, the only indicator or the only substance uh, where the, you know, the, the rates of women uh, are higher than the rates of men, uh, have, you know, use, tend to use more non-prescribed non uh, medicines. So this, uh, this is also, we can also see this, this is a graph uh, from a uh, recent report from the Sexism Free Night Project and uh, that, that analyzes, you know, uh, people that go out, go, go out at night um, from, uh, and this data, most of the people that answered the survey was around uh, 18 and 34 years old. And we can see here, that uh, again, the gender gap is lower uh, when we talk about legal and socially more acceptable drugs, let's say. And uh, however, th this in terms of lifetime prevalence, when we look at, uh, you know, uh, uses in the last 12 months, six months and even 30 days, the gender gap is a bit, a bit um, higher. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's always smaller when we talk about, um, you know, uh, legal and more socially accepted, uh, accepted drugs. So you can pass to the other one. Uh, so what we can see here is that uh, women tend to use um, more, you know, tend to connect more with uh, legal or um, uh, this kind of markets. And this is, um, it, and this is, uh, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. 
Uh, and this is interesting because probably, probably if we only think or if we only analyze uh, drugs from the perspective of illicit markets, probably we are not getting all the information regarding gender dynamics in terms of drug use. And here I would like to state several things that are relevant when analyzing drug use uh, among youth and young women who use drugs in social environments. Firstly, is that these this contexts um, remain uh, male dominated. So women, of course, are invited to lose control at, and to contact with intoxication. But at the same time, uh, they have to self control and, you know, keep their gender mandates and their gender roles very uh, active. Uh, in these space times, th there are also uh, sexualization of the women participation and is this uh, reproduction, uh, reproduction of what happens when women enter in the social sphere, um, that th their participation tend to be sexualized, uh, and this increases if they are using uh, drugs heavily, let's say. And at the same time, uh, we, can, we can consider that women are adopting, you know, the behaviors of reference on that uh, context that are, you know, male dominated, let, let, let's say, or masculine, uh, because these uh, space times and these behaviors were, um, were male exclusive until, um, uh, until recently. Uh, we also can find, and this is data from Sexism Free Night uh, report, um, we also can find gender differences in drug use motivation. Women report more social motivations, for example, to dance, uh, to fit with the group, uh, you know, to um, facilitate the social interaction. And men, it's interesting that they report more sexualized motivations, like to flirt, uh, to have sexual relations, or to increase sexual arousal. Uh, also, in what uh, refers to drug acquisition, um, I, I already told it, uh, women tend to, to connect more with legal and more socially accepted uh, drug markets. Uh, they uh, tend also to be introduced, to introduced by drugs and drug use patterns, the way the drugs are used by, you know, male partners. And this is also interesting. And in a focus group, some focus group I did some years ago, they were saying that they tend to have heavier uh, drug use patterns when, when they are in a relationship with uh, a man that have uh, heavier uh, drug use patterns. So that there is also this uh, relation. And it's also interesting to note that women uh, who use drugs at low frequencies uh, have more probability than men of acquiring drugs for free. So again, this um, lack of relation with uh, illicit, um, illicit drugs markets. So you can change it now. Uh, recent, I, I like to, to, you know, we already know that we don't burn with, with we, we don't burn, um, uh, we are born with a, you know, sexual characteristics, but not with a gender. So we learn what gender means and we, we are socialized uh, for gender. And in this uh, context, we can, can consider that drug use itself um, can be a gender performance. And this means that probably this behavior, um, you know, in drug using, um, probably that there are a negotiation with, between the traditional gender roles and experimenting with, with drugs. But I think it's also important because uh, Linda said it before, uh, several times we tend to see women who use drugs uniquely as victims and disempower it. But the thing is that prob there are also these agency dimensions, you know, and experimenting with drugs intentionally in building and expressing uh, new feminine uh, femininities in these, you know, contemporary contemporary lifestyles. Uh, so th there are also differences in, in terms of risk and protective behaviors. And I, as I said before, women tend to self-protect more, so limit the amount of alcohol of drugs they use. 
um, and uh, for example, to protect their, their drink to, to avoid uh, chemical submission, among other dimensions. And there are also gender differences in terms of the negative consequences related with uh, drug use. And in this case, uh, sexualized violence and social humiliation after heavy drinking or heavy, heavy drug use are gender, you know, gender specific um, risks since they affect disproportionately, tend to affect disproportionately women. And finally, just to finalize, we can also, it's also relevant to think in terms of uh, social norms and social reactions and gendered moralities towards women who use drugs. Uh, so of course we have gender double st standards in drug use, what means that we analyze the same behavior having gender as reference, okay? So we don't see drug use, we, we consider drug use differently if the person that are using the drug is a woman or a man. Uh, and this is very um, relevant for us in terms of uh, thinking um, the way we see, you know, the, the people with whom we work. And then there are always these kind of uh, moralities that tend to make women, uh, you know, that blame women in case they are victimized. Uh, uh, that and, and also that produce discourses that tend to degradate their public image, especially when we are talking about heavy drug users. And finally, there are also these psychological consequences that uh, we, we don't, don't talk a lot, but women tend to experience more moral hangover, meaning that after a, a, a drug use occasion, they tend to feel more guilt and uh, regret, and this may be related with internalized, um, you know, with internal internalization of traditional gender norms, and with the fact that they, they feel that somehow they uh, they they fail in their gender mandates. So yeah, I would like to say that um, it's very relevant to build. Um, to build a gender perspective when we analyze uh, drug use among young, younger women, because probably the social penalizations uh, related to drug use are more subtle than when we analyze other, other groups, uh, but, uh, but they must be addressed. And I probably finish here. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana, for offering this uh, first uh, view on uh, uh, women and drug use, considering uh, really the gender as a social uh, structure and construction. So now I uh, would like to give the floor, and there, uh, still there are some questions, but we will discuss, we hope to have some time to discuss, to discuss later. Um, and now I give the floor to the third speaker, the speaker uh, is Sarah Morton. Sarah is the director of the Community Drugs Program in University College in Dublin, and has a particular interest in women as substance use, particularly how these issues intersect with gender-based violence. She's also a member of the European Group on Gender and Drugs. Um, and uh, uh, we ask uh, uh, also Sarah the same question that we have asked to Christiana, how drug use behaviors among women change in the life course and how they've changed across generations with particular focus on older women and women who have developed drug related problems. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Linda. And I just welcome the opportunity to, to speak with Christine and Christiana and later Judy. Um, this is just such an important topic. So I wondered how to approach this. Um, struggles as I did with the idea that maybe if we weren't young, we're old, um, but maybe um, as across the life course. Um, so I might just go on to the next slide. Um, I really thought about from which perspective will we look at this particular topic? And I was thinking too, at, at a local and a regional and a national level, very often we get caught into a consideration of what women are doing. And I thought what I would much prefer to do is talk to you for kind of 10 minutes around how do we understand that the context and the experiences of women have changed? So rather than 
what they are doing, how do we understand the context within which they are um, surviving, thriving or behaving? Um, so I'm going to look at some of the changes in drug trends and drug markets, because, of course, they impact on women's substance use trajectories, particularly over the life course. I also wanted to build on what Christina and Christiana had said and look at some of our own emerging understandings and knowledge of women's experiences and from a very situated practice based knowledge. Um, and focusing again on what we understand differently perhaps over about women's experience than perhaps we did um, 10 or 15 years ago. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, I have a few ideas here around drug trends and drug markets, which you will see we, will link with the previous um, presentations. So one of the interesting things that Anderson and Kavanaugh talk about is how we need to think about new ways of how gender organizes and, and is embedded within illicit drug markets, including for them, they highlight the overlap and interplay of legal and illegal drugs in producing drug problems. And this is what we see when we're working with women over the life course, particularly around medication misuse um, and kind of choice of substances. Novel distribution styles, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, in a second, and also what the consequences for women um, are in relation, in relation to engaging in drug use. Um, some of the things that we've seen from a practice perspective are, is the impact of di digitalization of drug sale and supply, medication misuse and the changes in development in illicit medication supply and use, which particularly impacts on women. We've also seen in different contexts in, in Europe and beyond the increase in cocaine and crack cocaine supply and use. Um, and finally, another point that I'd add from this kind of situated knowledge is the impacts on all forms of transactional sex, um, sex working, exchange of sex for drugs, prostitution due to the digitalization and, um, and types of substances available and the digitalization both of those um, both markets. And I suppose the question we're left with, which, which links back exactly to um, our first presentation was, do our monitoring systems incorporate a gender view um, of emerging trends and impacts? So just moving on to the next slide. Um, there's just one kind of, I suppose, two sets of ideas that I wanted to run through around this. Um, Kolar talks around these kind of gendered stigma and normative standards, which again links very much with what Christiana talked about for, for young women and gendered accessibility. And this urges us to think about the gendered social organization of drug markets and how this impacts on women and their use and patterns. And also how we have conversations with women around this, um, because of course, traditionally, um, um, how we understand drug markets and how those have been monitored have been from a more patriarchal perspective. And I'll just move on to the next slide. One of the things that I find interesting when thinking about this is um, Anderson and Kavanaugh again look at these kinds of gender relations and the intersectionality of race and class and how that shapes experience and how does that also shape our understanding of drug markets and women's roles and functioning um, within this. For instance, they highlight that very often women's drug involvement intersects with situations of extreme economic and social disadvantage and other experiences of trauma. And also very often, even if they're in a relationship and um, a male partner is then incarcerated, that often impacts on women's access to material provisions. And it made me think about if we don't acknowledge um, the context of women's experience and the structural um, context of that, how can we basically support any positive change in her life when there's substance misuse issues? But also if those contexts and structural difficulties remain unchallenged or changed, then how can we also expect women to change? I'm just going to talk very briefly uh, around our kind of knowledge base on the next slide. Um, it, what I would, I suppose, like to argue at this point is that practice and intervention can serve as some of our main sites of knowledge of women's substance use patterns and trajectories over the life course. Um, some of the challenges around this is that our knowledge and understanding can remain very local and situational. 
And that knowledge extrapolation can be really difficult um, due to both the kind of patriarchal roots of our treatment and intervention systems and the underpinning ideology of treatment and intervention. So very often when we talk about this issue, there's real understanding of what women are experiencing, but we find that difficult to extrapolate into major system change. Um, one example of this would be an action research study that we did a year and a half ago. And when we talked to practitioners and asked them to consider their organizations around substance misuse treatment for women, they, there was a realization that they often internalized, even in quite subtle ways, the gender roles and expectations within their treatment and interventions and their work with women. So where does that leave us? Um, I'll just move on to the next slide. Um, there's two more themes that I want to touch on before we look at the end at the kind of implications. Um, we've talked about this idea of trauma. And again, ACEs is one that is a particular view of trauma. But what we know around ACEs and women is that sexual experiences of sexual abuse, physical abuse and exposure to parental domestic violence as a child have independent positive relationships to lifetime drug and alcohol issues. But what we also know is that 90% of women in substance misuse treatment have a history of traumatic violence. So there's evidence of this lifespan victimization um, and a combination of adverse childhood experiences and trauma in childhood and substance use puts women at further risk for future domestic violence and sexual abuse. So this lifespan aspect is key. Um, and for instance, in one study, it was found that women involved in the criminal justice system linked themselves, their whole trajectory and experiences of substance misuse and later harms to adversity um, experienced in childhood. So just the next slide has a couple of points around intersectionality. We know that um, substance use patterns and trajectories are often different from women. And Christina talked already about this idea of telescoping and ac accelerated progression. And we also know that women's substance use may inter intersect with these wider social um, factors. So other factors may also predicate or compound experiences of exclusion, you know, migrant status, disability, poverty, homelessness. So what are the implications for us around this? Um, and I came up with three because I thought this is so complicated, we need a way forward. <laughs> um, and these are the three questions that I was left with that I thought it might be useful to think about. How do we design and develop interventions and responses that circumnavigate patriarchal constructs and understandings of drug markets and substance misuse treatment? How do we incorporate the embodied and lived experience of women's substance use across the life course and beyond the lens of pregnancy and motherhood, which is very often how policy and intervention um, has started to focus or initial focus. And also my final um, kind of implication was, we, I feel we really need to consider how we may be internalizing or normalizing these dominant constructs and expectations of women's behavior and life course within our responses and interventions. And Christiana and I did not manage to actually link those ideas, but we linked them perfectly. <laughs> um, so I just moved to my final slide. Um, and that's just my contact details. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah, for offering also, as you say, a way forward, not just uh, pointing out uh, the, the main issues, which is important. And also you offer really the link to the next uh, presentation, which is the last but not least, of course, um, Judy Chang. So uh, Judy is the executive director of the International Network of People Who Use Drugs. Judy has worked in the HIV and the community-based health and development field for over a decade and has close to 20 years of lived experience of, as a woman who use drugs and as a client of harm reduction services to her role. Judy holds a master's in international development and bachelor of arts in writing and contemporary culture. And she attended the first European technical meeting on gender and drugs. So we would like to ask the same question that we have asked to Christiana and Sara to Judy, but from the perspective, the user perspective. So how drug use behaviors change among women who use drugs? Judy doesn't have a PowerPoint, but she will reply directly on the screen. Thank you, Judy, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Linda, and to EMC DDA as well for their skillful organization and bringing together of this webinar on women who use drugs. So just to start off with, um, just, you know, want to also acknowledge that I think, you know, any as any of us who've worked and researched drug use and harm reduction for any significant amount of time, you know, we know that the more we work on it, the bigger, more complex and more unwieldy the issue becomes. You know, illicit drug use patterns and trends have indeed changed from more tra traditional drugs such as heroin, cannabis, cocaine and speed to newer drug trends such as NPS, synthetic cannabinoids, synthetic opioids such as fentanyl and methamphetamine. So as I think as you know, we've seen drugs research has also become more complex. Um, as we've seen from the two excellent presentations today. And as over time, I think we've learned to bring in more of the nuance and more reflection um, on this complexity. So gender, along with many other intersecting social and structural factors, such as class, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, and gender identity, influence patterns of use, but it also influences how we use drugs and what impacts not only drug use, but drug policies have on our experiences of drug use. So I think any consideration, any serious consideration of gender and other social factors means that we can't just simply accept that drug dependency is easily explained as a disease to be simply cured. <clears throat> Being able to acknowledge this nuance and complexity means we can be begin to produce more accurate and nuanced research which will lead to better policies that are more appropriate and most importantly, healthy, socially integrated people that aren't disconnected, incarcerated or literally dying in their hundreds of thousands from preventable deaths. So in my talk, I also wanted to focus, of course, um, I want to centre my own lived experience of drug use over life courses, you know, from a gendered perspective. I may not be a young person that uses drugs anymore, but definitely once was. I would probably be defined now in my middle age, <laughs> um, but I'm in a position to reflect on my drug using career up till now. And I think drug use, which not many people really consider, is also a search for meaning for the individual in a lot of ways. So like many people, if I look at the start of my drug using career, you know, started from a young age, 13, 14. Of course, these are the teenage years. I'm sure everyone can relate. They're typical ages for experimentation. So the recreational use of cannabis, acid, ecstasy, speed. And I think, you know, during this point as well, most of the experiences were positive and there's always that element of, you know, seeking pleasure. I would say, yes, about 19, about 18, 19, um, you know, moved to heroin use, um, developed a habit, so drug dependent. Um, but I think unlike some trends amongst women who inject drugs, um, also learned to inject myself very quickly, you know, so had that independence. Um, I think, you know, it's not, as much as the media says dependency isn't immediate, developing a habit isn't immediate, um, but it wasn't done, you know, completely inadvertently either. Um, you know, there's reasons that people and women use drugs. It helps to, you know, numb people. It helps to, you know, regulate emotions and mental state. And I think generally, you know, we accept the stereotype of people who use drugs and probably particularly of women who use drugs of this, you know, sense of being out of control, that it always means being out of control of our own bodies and minds. But, you know, that's not the whole truth. I think that, you know, drug use um, and many of us who use drugs do use drugs to have some control, some semblance of control over the state of mind and how we respond and react to situations. So it was about two years later, so, you know, probably quite early on um, that I entered into methadone treatment and, you know, contrary to people's beliefs also, you know, treatment doesn't always mean you stop taking drugs. Many people continue. Um, to use drugs, but it does help to better control and regulate that drug use. 
And this, you know, this consideration does, should be, and was supposed to be at the heart of harm reduction programs, right? This non-judgment, that it shouldn't be tied to expectations of abstinence or accepting that it's okay to try and punish people who don't stay abstinent. So in considering the role of gender um, in this use, you know, looking, I think we do need to look at alternative framings as well. And I, we, when we apply a feminist lens um, to it, I think, you know, there's just a different framing and consideration, a kind of widening um, of meaning for drug use as well. So myself, I came from, a, I come from a migrant family um, and, you know, experimentation and drug use is a lot of times a part of rebelling, you know, I was pushing back on what was expected of me, what society, my family told me I should do or be. As the two other speakers have said, you know, we know women who use drugs are judged way more harshly than men. This is because drug use is seen as risk-taking behaviour and drug dependency, you know, is often perceived as selfish and women are expected to conform to gender norms of good behaviour and selflessness. So it's not to say that, you know, personal trauma does not play a role, um, but I think we do inordinately focus a lot on individualised trauma and we don't really, you know, weight enough the structural harms of criminalisation, drug policies and gender equality. So, for instance, because of stigma and discrimination that is very much fueled by drug laws, women who use drugs, including myself, are much more likely to hide our drug use, which means we use alone, and that means we're more likely to overdose. We're more avoidant of harm reduction in healthcare services because of the shame and judgment. And as other speakers have mentioned before, you know, we're more vulnerable to sexual harassment, not only from police, but also from medical personnel and doctors because once we're out about our drug use, even if it's you know, just in front of one doctor, there's this you know, sense that they can get away with things that they never would um, in front of other clients. So I think now at my age, middle age, when I you know, look at my drug use career, um, I feel that there is more control of my drug use than ever before. I think in a lot of ways that does accord with life stages you know, people generally find their lives becoming more stable. It's less about experimentation and more about consolidation. Um, but, you know, I also come from <clears throat> a place of privilege and that, you know, I have found a place and meaning in life. I get to have a job and live a life where I don't have to feel ashamed about drug use. And I think, you know, in some ways that's part of a feminist impulse of not allowing others to make you feel shame for wanting to make the, your own decisions about your own body and mind. That's not to say, you know, the way society judge, judges, um, that people are immune to this judgment, um, but I have been fortunate in many ways. So I haven't been incarcerated, but have definitely lived through the fear of fear and harassment. Um, I've never lost a job because of my drug use. Um, I was able to be financially dependent, independent, um, and worked in the sex industry. Um, I've never been a mother who's had to watch their child being taken away, though I know at the same time, you know, a court will most likely never allow me to adopt as an out drug user. I've pretty much always had access to harm reduction or found innovative ways to access it. So I think there are all these unique ways that we found to punish women who use drugs, which the world justifies because of misconceptions and stereotypes. But how the world views women who use drugs, you know, does not match my own experiences, nor my worldview of the people and the community that I see around me. So I really do see women who use drugs as being some of the most real, authentic, smart, insightful, funny, empathetic, and incredibly resilient. You know, we survive through a world that truly tries to break you down and wants to make you feel that there is something inherently wrong with you. You know, so much to the point that we imprison women who use drugs and sometimes resort to torture in order to fix people. So the only women who are able to survive this and still retain some semblance of pride and dignity and who refuse to, be, who refuse to hide and be silent, you know, are the strongest. 
So looking forwards and, you know, what needs to change. So just, you know, five recommendations. Um, not simple, but very important, and we should be looking to progress them. So one, to be able to change our perceptions and attitudes and counter misinformation on drug use by acknowledging its nuance and complexity. And we need to be sharing narratives that aren't all negative because there are also positive stories to share. So one example that I would point to is a narco, it's called the Narco Feminism Story Share Project. Um, it's run by Urban Survivors Union um, in the US. So it's basically a storytelling project of women who use drugs. Two, so the need to produce research, particularly qualitative research that captures the complexity of drug use amongst women and make sure women who use drugs are meaningfully involved in this research. Three, to fully decriminalize drug use. You know, as we all know, there are successful country examples in Europe, so there isn't the need to look very far. Four, Services need to understand the needs of women who use drugs. And we know that understanding these needs will only come from listening and treating women who use drugs as equal partners. And I do agree with Sarah's presentation as well, that the treatment system is very patriarchal with you know, lots of rules and regulations um, to try and like shape people into you know, what the system thinks people should be. And five, Last but not least, the critical to fund and politically support women who use drugs led organizations and responses in line with the global AIDS targets that every country in Europe has committed to. So, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just, yeah, you are really on. We are really on time, perfectly on time. So, we have time for some uh, question. I saw that there were already some question for Christina. Christina replied to some of these questions. I don't know if you want to add something in the question and answer regarding, uh, um, I see that, that you, yeah, the first question regarding uh, if AGA will pay specific attention to women who use drugs in your work related to gender-based violence. Do you want to answer, Christina? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, apologize because I was so fast. I wanted just to type answer and I and I click on answer live. So now I cannot go backwards. So, <laughs> the, but uh, yeah, that uh, there are, the only thing that we are planning to do in relation to integrate uh, drugs use into the gender-based violence uh, uh, projects is that uh, you know that we are now, Eurostat has conducted a new gender-based violence survey and, uh, and uh, FRA and EIGE together in a joint project will cover the member states that are not taking place in the Eurostat survey on, the, on violence against women. And uh, what we have uh, done, I think that uh, mainly because of your initiative and the Council of Europe initiative is to include uh, a question or what we will try to, to to have a set of questions in relation to, to drug use. Then the results of this survey that it's, uh, it's planned to be published in 2024. And uh, in some countries, uh, they, they have already started the implementation of the survey. In the eight countries that FRA and EIGE will cover, the survey will be conducted this year. So, this is the only thing that uh, I do think that, you know, in order to, to have this intersectional approach and to cover all women's experience, we should include in our, uh, our gender-based violence uh, projects, the, the drug use dimension. So I think that it, uh, we will try to think how to integrate this dimension because I think that it's really important or to to liaise with the EMC BBI and see if we can have a joint project on this. Thank you, thank you, Christina. Uh, there was another question. I'm not sure if uh, uh, I understood regarding, I think, the um, link between like neuroscience and social uh, sciences, uh, how the changes also in the bodies or uh, can affect the changes in drug use behavior. But we would like to um, uh, just 
to point out that it's difficult to reply to this question and it's really important always to consider uh, the influence of the social context and uh, as he was saying in all this uh, presentation uh, in every uh, type of behavior uh, on drug use behavior in particular for women. So Linda, that's, I noticed yes? another question for uh, Christina from Aige about the inclusion of non-binary yeah. uh, gender definitions. I would say that there are great expectations about the work of your agency, Christina. These questions highlight a huge interest in, in your present and, and future uh, work. Yeah, it's very difficult to answer. So we want to, to expand uh, the, the the, the, the collection of data and to include also that uh, non-binary, but when we are talking about administrative data and when the, we are collecting data on violence against women, we are uh, talking mainly about the administrative data. So that it's um, data that is coming from the recorded uh, data in the national uh, statistical systems. And most of the time this data is collected uh, based on sex. Also, you know that um, that we need. I think that we we need uh, to have a better conceptual framework. You know, because we will be collecting data on non-binary. But um, are we sure that we will know how to interpret this data? You know, so we have this framework when we have data disaggregated by sex, and we have the gender as a category of analysis for our for our interpretation. But when we are talking about uh, non-binary. And uh, if we don't have this uh, sex disaggregation also, you know, it's, it's difficult. We, for, for, for policy reasons, for, for measures, I think that, you know, that the, it's, it's very rich. We can have like, you know, that which is the impact on the health, on the access to services, on everything by non-binary persons. So in this sense, it's, uh, I think that it's very rich and we need to include uh, non-binary in our uh, data collections. But when we want to really analyze the impact, you know, for instance, in this drug use, if we are if we are losing the sex dimension and we are using the, the socialization based uh, on gender, but based on the sex that you were born. So it's I think that it's really difficult to, to interpret. No. Uh, so I think that we need to build a better conceptual framework on how to interpret this data. And, uh, but for sure, it's like, I think that, you know, this is a, a way to go, you know, not to, not to leave people behind or aside that we need to include everybody in our, in our, um, in our uh, statistics, but we need also to build a framework that we can, we can understand the data that we are collecting. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. There is another question um, that can be for everyone. I would start maybe with Christiana. Uh, so it's, uh, Maria Rivera asks if I like to know your opinion on about legal drug use, tranquilizer sedatives and women, not related to experimentation or tra trauma. Mari uh, Christiana, if you want to okay. comment, you presented this in you. Okay, so you asked me to comment because I was uh, looking at uh, over medication of women like one, 100 yeah. years ago. Uh, with morphine and other drugs. And this was uh, something um, that, that I was uh, exploring during a, a historical analysis of women who use drugs in Portugal. And there, there is this trend. And actually when looking at uh, contemporary data, at least in Portugal, but I think uh, we can find it also in other countries, for example, in Spain, but, but also others, uh, that, uh, you know, there are higher levels of women using uh, prescription uh, psychopharmacs. Uh, and uh, on the other way around, uh, also there are more, more, you know, higher rates of women using, you know, uh, prescription opioids, for example, or other opioids uh, rather than uh, heroin. So this is interesting because again, shows this, demonstrates this connection or this uh, link between women and uh, you know, legal or more socially accepted markets. And, um, and also it, uh, it shows that possibly um, not, 
you know, because you are asking specifically not only regarding the trauma experiences, but I think, for example, women uh, nowadays have a lot of mental load uh, that is related with the work life and also with the maternity rules and all these, uh, you know, overlapping of expectations and, and roles they have. And probably uh, and possibly this, this uh, is also a cause for searching for more you know, mental health care and consequent, uh, consequently to, to have uh, a medication. So um, this is something that is very clear. Um, the connection of women, for example, with alcohol, tobacco and also with psychopharmacs and growingly with cannabis. And uh, in order to have a gender perspective on drug use, I think we need to redefine what do we mean by drugs and looking not only for the illicit markets, but only for the other ones, because probably there women are not a minority. So I would just say this. Thank you, Christiana. I don't know if uh, Judy or Sarah want to add anything on this. Yes, I think if we yeah, just add to Christina's point, I think, um, you know, looking at the 1950s, there was definitely this, you know, overtreatment and this biomedical, you know, everything will be fixed with a pill. But I think that was also part of like not being able to um, accept difference, you know, and I think also back then there was a lot more constraints on women overall and much more strict kind of gender norms. And if women were outside of their place, then it was this sense, you know, they then need to see a doctor and be medicated. And yes, I think, you know, things have changed over time, but I just think it also shows, you know, the damage um, of, gen you know, very strict gender norms and hierarchies and also that, you know, things can't just be fixed necessarily always with a pill or the biomedical Thank approach. Thank you, Judy. Now, uh, I think there is another question that we move on intervention. So John is, Bennett asked, based on the presentation, would professional training in the drug field benefit from a stronger gender equality orientation? I don't know if, Sarah, do you want to reply? I can start the response to that, perhaps, <laughs> the others. Um, I think this goes back to the, the points that all of us were making, but I think both Judy and I were reiterating these around the kind of patriarchal systems that have um, developed over time around both understanding drug markets, but also responding to the impacts for women. So um, that's very embedded. There's fantastic innovation um, in different jurisdictions. Um, we've all worked with fantastic projects that are doing fantastic work, but that hasn't been mainstreamed. So of course, it, the question becomes, as, as John says, how do we start to systemize that, that change? Thank Christiana, you, Sarah. Christina, yeah. Yes, Christiana. Uh, yes, I think training is uh, the first step because uh, our uni university degrees and most of you know the, the specialized training in drug drugs and drug addiction don't have you know really uh, gender transversally in their curriculum. So for sure that the access to uh, good quality training on gender mainstreaming and also the connection. Uh, between you know gender and uh, and drugs is very uh, relevant in this way to to change you know the practices or at least to begin um, um, to create a bigger understanding what what means you know or the the, the relevance of um, you know the fact that drugs and the drug use behaviors are not natural they are influenced by you know so social structures uh, that are asymmetric so for sure we need to to be in contact with this context and build uh, understanding on on them uh, to increase uh, the way we work and just to connect with my presentation because i was hearing my colleagues and i think i didn't finalize it with uh, with uh, kind of recommendations or things to do uh, when talking about youth and young women, uh, probably this group is more, um, they connect more with prevention, probably, and harm reduction. And I came from the harm reduction field, specifically in nightlife environments, and most of the interventions are gender neutral also. 
So for sure, we need, uh, we are learning how to do it. We are learning how to consider um, gender, but to do so, we have to connect, you know, with the feminist theories and the queer th theories and, you know, uh, try to have another lens to analyze the behaviors uh, we want to, you know, uh, we are working on. So probably I will stay thank here. You, thank, thank you, Christiana. And I think we can take maybe a last question. Does have from Mary Millet, does having men working with women in addiction reinforce patriarchy? That's, uh, she said, for, for Judy. <laughs> Um, well, yes, I think when, you know, we've looked at how to make um, harm reduction services and treatment services more gender sensitive, there's definitely recommendations for, you know, hiring more women and especially peer workers. I think there is that element always of you feel more comfortable, like speaking to someone that's more like you um, and, yeah, as I also said before, the treatment system can be experienced as very patriarchal. So there is, you know, already that lack of an established trust um, with the patriarchal system. But then, you know, with um, if you're mainly engaging with a male doctor or other healthcare professional. But that's not to say that, you know, men working within the system like shouldn't also be sensitized and um, be able to you know, also be gender sensitive in the way that they approach women and understand um, issues more. I think we all, you know, also agree that being able to, you know, um, re redefine masculinities, you know, is also, and gender equality is also about, like, um, sensitizing men to be better as well. Um, so, yes, I think, you know, it can be complex, but I think, yes, a lot of the time, you know, making sure that we're hiring women, um, and women in all their diversity, you know, does help. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Maybe we have time for the last question, Marika. Yes, there is one more question on, on the services for, for drug users and, and people who use drugs by Greece. Uh, I'm really interested to discuss in which ways we could change the way intervention is given to women. Um, if I can add something from my side, I liked this mention of uh, diversity. I think the objective here is to help people to be helpful altogether because it's not one way direction only, and probably to take more and more into consideration the characteristics of individuals rather than fostering a kind of an aversion between, between the two main genders. But I leave the, the discussion uh, to you about what can be practically beyond what you said already be done to, to make the services more uh, welcoming uh, gender uh, differences. Who want to... Maybe I'll go back to Sarah, maybe. I'd love to answer that one. <laughs> I'll start the, the thread. Um, I just noticed there's another question in the chat as well about, you know, this, this is a parallel around kind of pregnancy and motherhood and, and what can we do around responding to women. So I put both of those in together. Um, one of the things is that we know is that women often don't pitch up to the service that we expect them to. So um, very often, if substance use is the major issue, it's the domestic violence service that they may pitch up to or go to. And there's really interesting research that shows that women actually go to the service um, that responds to what they feel is the biggest risk in their lives. So we may think it's their substance use, but for them, it could be the domestic violence or their health association with their pregnancy. Or So I think one of the things we need to do is normalize um, substance use, um, whatever service we're providing and know the interrelationships um, I think some of the biggest changes we've seen in innovation is the wide range of star services starting to um, normalize and routinely inquire about women's substance use um, and accepting its functionality in all its forms um, the other things that we've 
found kind of in research is that trust is the key thing um, in, in all services and women specific services or services where women can feel very safe, where safety is prioritized and that that is really attended to. So I might pass over to some of the others because I know they'll have comments too. Yeah, Christiana. Uh, yes, I would like to complement what uh, Sarah just said uh, with this idea that we had applied in Cosmicare growingly, that is the concept of collaborative networks. And uh, by this, I mean to create uh, intentional uh, bridges between those who are working in the gender field. For example, we are planning an intervention in a large scale event next month, next month between, you know, Cosmicare that is specialising in harm reduction in, in nightlife events. Uh, and also, you know, uh, a rape crisis centre in Porto and another organisation specialising in date violence. So through this connection, we can create, you know, a really, really gender um, responsive um, um, collaboration, you know, to, to you know, to, to capitalize, let's say, from the ex ex specialization of each partner to build comprehension of, on this field. And we did it also with other topics. For example, now we, we want also to create um, a collaborative network with organizations working in the sexual health fields, mental health, and also gender diversity to try to create also, you know, a harm reduction coll collaborative effort to respond to the needs of uh, queer transgender and non-binary people who use drugs also here in Porto and Lisbon. So just wanted to add that this collaborative effort between areas that are always separated, it's relevant. And just to finalize, because we also find a lot of stigma and prejudices towards drug use in the gender field, at least in my experience, there are, you know, also biases because we are talking about two social constructions, drugs and uh, gender. So the other area has also their their um, their own you know biases towards uh, drugs. Thank you, Christian. I think we arrived to the end. I uh, would like just to inform. It was already put in the chat that uh, uh, we are organizing uh, a side event. You, uh, thanks, Alessandra, on the twenty second of November. This is an event that is organized in cooperation with the Pompidou Group of the Council of Europe, Europe and the Portuguese CICAT, and at the margin of uh, um, at side as a side event. As I say, the registration are open. Is uh, there is no registration fee for this event. And just I would like to mention this uh, uh, event is the result of a work of a group that is, I mentioned before, the European Group on Gender and Drugs that was set up around three years ago um, in occasion of the past edition, edition of uh, Lisbon Addiction and include several experts from European countries working on gender and drugs and several institutions, including AGE, UNICRI, Pompidou Group of the Council of Europe, US, and experts from different countries. And we have really the objective to try to include them in, in a more systematic way as a gender perspective in the drug field. So if you want to subscribe, you have time until end of September. I give the floor back to Marika for the conclusion. Thanks. Thank you very much. We also, we are receiving a lot of positive remarks from our uh, public, which is always uh, very good to see. Um, I also thank you, everybody. N nothing to add. You made already very good conclusions. And uh, Alexis announced before he wasn't able to be with us, and we prefer to do without uh, conclusions. But uh, I will just launch a quick poll for people to answer about their opinion and how we can improve the webinars. You don't need to remain connected. We will remain connected a little bit more, and then we will circulate news about the next webinars. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Ale. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, all the public that makes our uh, webinars so interesting. Thank you very much. Also, during the webinar, a lot of resources were shared in the chat. We collect all of them, and we will definitely consider and, and reshare with our public. Thank you very much, everybody.